And if you haven't been with us for the past couple of years, we've been coming back to this and we're walking through the book of Acts. But we're walking through it not just for the purpose of understanding the story of the church and what the church was meant to be, but also for the purpose of us learning how to experience God through his word. How do we get better at experiencing God through the scriptures? And we walk back into that next week. We're really excited to get that started. But this week, as we come together, we are wrapping up our conversation celebrating summer. And if you, if you haven't been with us for the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at, okay, how do we live our summer in such a way that we can look back on it and celebrate? How, how do we live our summer in such a way that, that we grow closer to him instead of growing further from him, that we rest in him instead of resting from him. And it's important for you to know that for us, this journey, it's not a religious journey. It's a relational journey. It's not about living up to a religious standard. It's about a relationship with someone. And as we look at the summer ahead, it's not, okay, how do we live up to, to religious demands? It's not, that's not at all what this journey is about. That's not at all what the invitation of Jesus is about. It's a relationship. And so we're looking at it and say, how do we grow closer to him? How do we know his love more? How do we know his joy more? How do we know his peace more? How, how do we know his gentleness and his kindness? How are we closer to him at the end of it as opposed to further from him? And we've been looking at that specifically, specifically in light of the summer and this reality that seasons change things and that you need to pay attention to seasons. Ecclesiastes 3.1, for everything there's a season, the time for every activity under heaven. In the first week, we looked at the reality of seasons and when a season shifts, whether it's a seasons in life or seasons of the year, when a season shifts, you need to adjust your plan because things aren't going to be the same. So how do we adjust our plan of how we're going to pursue him, of how we're going to experience him in light of the fact that the season is shifting? We've looked at a couple different areas of how we can do that. One, how we experience God's word, how we engage God's word, how how we engage music and use the tool of music to influence and, and to impact us. We talked about rest last week and how we build rest into the craziness of the summer. And it's been really, it has been really encouraging to me because I've heard from so many of you. And for so many of you, you're beginning to read or to listen to God's word. For some of you, for the very first time in your life, and you have a plan of how you're going to do that this summer. I can't wait to see how that's going to impact your life. For others of you, you're beginning to, to step into and be exposed to music that you never heard before. And you downloaded that playlist on Spotify and you're starting to listen to that music. And, and I've heard from a couple of you are like, man, this, it's, it's really powerful, the impact that it has on me. And I'm telling you, if we can adjust our plan, if we can adjust our plan as we walk in the next three months, we can live a summer that we can look back on and celebrate. But today, as we wrap this thing up, I want to build on that one more time. I want to talk to you about one last thing that I think is crucial as we develop our plan for the summer. One last thing that I believe that we have to shift. It's it's remarkable to me how many times when I sit and listen to people's stories, And they tell me about the turns in their stories. They tell me about the shifts in their story. Whether it be good or bad, the turns in their life where they made a decision that that had great outcomes or the times in their life where they made a decision that had terrible outcomes. It's amazing to me how many times when they share their story, it begins with, and then I met, or then I started to hang out with, or then I started to date, It's amazing to me how many times, and I think this is true of your story as well, if you were to look back at the shifts in your story, those major turns where you change direction, it's amazing to me how many times, how many times that change in direction is based on community. Today, I I, I wanna go back today to something that I've been saying over and over and over again throughout this series, which is this. Influence is more powerful than information. Pay more attention to the friends that you make than the books that you read. Because the people that you surround yourself with 
will shape who you become. A well-informed person who's not careful with his companions will not live a wise life. A well-informed person, and many of you know well-informed people who weren't careful with their companions, and therefore, they did not live a wise life. It blows me away how over and over and over again I sit down with individuals and they tell me about the best decisions or the worst decisions in their life and the story always begins with community. Because it's the people in your life, the people in your life that shape who it is that you're becoming who shape where it is that you're going. As a matter of fact, for many of you, even if I were to walk around this room and ask you about the impact that God has made on your life and how you're pursuing God or how you're experiencing God, and I were to tell you, I were to say, well, what is, it that, what is it that caused that? What is it that led to this? You wouldn't talk to me about something that I said. You talk to me about people. But then I met so-and-so. But then, then, then I got connected to this dinner group, or, or, or then I, I got connected to this team, and, and then so-and-so stepped into my life. Almost every major shift in our life is impacted by community, because influence is more powerful than information, and community, community is crucial. Community is crucial. And God, throughout the scriptures, throughout the entire biblical narrative, is calling us to realize just how crucial it is. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says this, Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. He says, even if you have phenomenal character, even if you have phenomenal character, but you're not careful with your companions, it will change who it is that you Become. You look at our meditation passage for this month. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. He says, pay attention. Pay attention to your community. Because your community, it dictates your future. But community is tricky. Community is tricky for a variety of different reasons. One of the reasons why community is tricky is because when you're younger, community is shaped for you. For most of us, when we're younger, community was shaped for us. And community had to do with the schools that we were a part of or the teams that we were on or the clubs that we were a part of. And for most of us, our parents were trying to shift that. And we're watching that community and trying to shape that community. And even inside of college, that continues to a degree. And schools are designed to be able to help you to build that community and they're trying to help you shape that but then as you step out of college you walk into a world where all of a sudden nobody is creating community for you which is why for many of you when you moved here to Hoboken you struggled with community because you never actually had to build it for yourself and make no mistake about it you are the one who has to create community for you no one's going to do it for you Which is why for some of you, you still continue to struggle with community. For others of you, it's not that you necessarily struggle with community. You just kind of fell into community. And so it's just continued to be based on your surroundings. So it's the the people that you work with or the people that you live closest to or the people who happen to go to the party that you went to. And you just kind of fall into it. As a matter of fact, very few of us pay a lot of attention to our community or the community that we've created, or the community that we live in. And yet God is stepping into our lives and saying, pay, 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 pay attention, pay attention to community, because it shapes, it shapes who you're becoming. And the scriptures don't just call us to pay attention to community, but the scriptures call us to what healthy community looks like. And healthy community, it doesn't have to do with the number of people in your community, but one of the things that you see throughout the scriptures is that God's calling us to develop different types of relationships in our lives. 
That community isn't just one relationship. It isn't the same type of relationship, but there are multiple types of relationships that are important in our lives in developing community that's going to move us to where we want to be rather than just falling into it. And for some of us, we fell into it. And so you made new friends and all of a sudden one day you wake up and you're wearing Birkenstocks and you don't know why. I can't believe those things are making a comeback. Oh, please fight against that. Fight, fight hard against that. That should not happen. Or you wake up one day and all of a sudden, all of a sudden financially you're in trouble because you surrounded yourself with people who live beyond their means. Or one day you wake up and you find yourself content because you surrounded yourself with people who are content. It shapes shapes who it is that we're becoming, and God says, pay attention to it. And then there are crucial relationships in it. And God calls us to develop particular relationships in our lives in order to have healthy community. Now, the way that we usually talk about it here at Hoboken Grace is something that's called circles. And we talk about it in terms of Paul's life. Paul's actually the individual who wrote that passage in 1 Corinthians that talked about bad company corrupting good character. But it's interesting, when you look at Paul's life, Paul has a variety of different relationships that he maintains throughout his life. And they exemplify what God has called us to develop in terms of community in our own lives. One of the relationships that you see in Paul's life, both with him being this to Timothy, but then also when Paul goes back to Jerusalem to talk to Peter, he's asking other people to speak into his life. When Paul is led by Jesus in the wilderness to be trained by him, he's asking people to speak into his life. And he's exemplifying something that God has taught us is very important in our lives. And that is this, you need mentors in your life. You need people who are speaking into your life. You need people that you can walk through those difficult situations and circumstances with. You need people that you can reach out to and you know that they're going to bring you or they're going to lead you to wisdom. And one of the things that God has taught us in his word, and you see it exemplified in Paul's life, is that you need mentors. You need people who can speak truth to you. Now, mentors can be a little bit tricky because we make mistakes sometimes with mentors. One, we we think of mentors as saviors. And so sometimes when people think, I need a mentor, especially with with younger people sometimes, and and college students, they say, they come up to me, well, you be my mentor, and I can hear it in their voice. They're looking for a savior. They're looking for someone who has all the answers. They're looking for someone who has everything together. And listen to me, if you're the person who gets approached by that person, Listen to me, because some of you think of yourselves a little higher than you should. And some of us, we, we fall into that trap of thinking, you know what, I probably could be your savior. You better be careful, because that never ends well. It never ends well. There's only one savior. There's only one savior. And that's Jesus. A good mentor is not the person who tries to be your savior. A good mentor is someone who consistently points you to Jesus. Who's consistently calling you back to Jesus. A mentor is not a a savior. One of the other mistakes is that we want one person to be our mentor, and that's it. That's not the way that that mentorship looks. And when when you look at the scriptures, it talks about having advisors. It talks about a plethora of people who are speaking into your life. There's multiple people, not just one person who has the answers. And the truth is, the idea of mentorship from a biblical perspective is not someone who has the answers. Listen, listen, Listen very carefully to me on this. The, the word, the word that I think it, in the scriptures captures best what you're looking for in a mentor and, and the word that the scriptures use more than someone who has all the answers, that type of idea. The word that scriptures use is the word discernment. What you're looking for in a mentor is someone who has discernment. You see, the the truth is, the truth is, answers are never that simple. No one has all the answers because every situation is unique and it's different. And someone who has discernment has the ability to be able to see that and has the ability to not just share truth, but to be able to share truth at the right time in the right place in the right way. There's a big difference between having information and having discernment. There's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. 
you have to have discernment. Let, let, me, let, me, take you, let me take you to a passage where, where God is calling us to the, the reality of discernment. This is, this is an amazing passage in the book of Proverbs. It's found in Proverbs chapter 26, and I'm going to read to you two passages. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4, and then verse 5. Let's look first at verse 4. Verse 4 says this. It says, Don't an- answer the foolish arguments of fools, or you will become as foolish as they are. Pretty straightforward. He's writing to us. He says, Listen, don't answer the foolish arguments of fools, or you're going to become as foolish as they are. Don't get caught up in that conversation. It's actually going to harm you instead of helping you. Then, the next verse, the next verse, verse 5, listen to what it says. Be sure to answer the foolish arguments of fools, or they will become wise in their own estimation. You want me to go back one? Jump back. Don't answer the foolish arguments of fools. Next verse. Be sure to answer the foolish arguments of fools. What? Now you're just messing with us. What's the writer teaching us? It's not about the right answer. It's about discernment. Discernment is the ability to know which proverb to follow in the given circumstance. And the writer is calling us not just to knowledge and information. He says, no, 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 you need wisdom. And wisdom is not just truth. Wisdom is truth at the right time, in the right place, in the right way. And that takes discernment. What you're looking for when you look for a mentor is someone with discernment. They don't need to know everything. But do they have the ability to take in the facts and to be able to help you walk through them so that you can have discernment in the choice that you make. One of the things that Paul tells Timothy, one of the things that that Paul tells Timothy is not to allow people to despise his age. I would say the same thing to you when it comes to mentors. Don't look at someone who's younger than you and say, well, they can't be a mentor to me. I've seen discernment in people who are very young. And I, I don't go to them for answers and I don't go to them for experience, but I do go to them because of the fact that they process things with discernment. Those are the people that you want to build those relationships with where they are the mentors in your life. They bring discernment into your life. Now, let me speak, let me speak to those of you who have discernment for just one second because you need to be very careful with that because discernment can very quickly lead to pride. And listen to me very closely. Listen, listen. Once pride enters the picture, pride will drive discernment from any home that it inhabits. Listen very carefully to me. Pride will drive discernment from the home, any home that it inhabits. And once you allow pride in, you lose discernment. But God's stepping into our lives and saying, you need to be, be careful about community. You need to be careful about community. You need mentors. You need people that can speak into your life. It's an important circle. The next one that, that you see in, in Paul's life is exemplified by an individual named Barnabas. Later on, it's, he's replaced with Silas, but these, these are his companions. You need companions in your life. You need friends. You need people You need people that you can laugh with. You need people that you can cry with. You need people that you can journey with. You need people who will shake their heads like this when you tell them how stupid you are. You need those people in your life. But you need to be careful about who those people are. You need to make sure that your companions are pointing you towards truth instead of away from truth. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. And when you look at Paul's journey, Barnabas is his companion. Early on, Barnabas actually speaks into Paul's life. Many people don't see that in the book of Acts, but early on, Barnabas is actually sent to speak into Paul's life. But later on, they're companions, and they're on this journey together. You need those 
people. Paul had a plethora of these people. There were people that traveled with him constantly. When you hear about the books that he's writing, he's surrounded by companions. Luke was another one of his companions who was with him. And they're able to journey together. They're able to carry one another. They're able to fight for one another. You need those people in your life. Another one that you see in his life is the Timothys. The book of Timothy and the book of Titus are both Paul writing to his apprentice. And both Timothy and Titus were the individuals that Paul was pouring his life into and that he's investing in. You need people that you're pouring into. And I know for some of you, because sometimes when I talk about this, people will say to me, they'll say, well, no, no, I need to be poured into more before I pour into anyone else. And sometimes there can be this idea that, no, no, I need to take in more before I can give to anyone else. I would argue that that goes directly against even the, even the very way that Jesus called his disciples. It's important for you to know this. The, the invitation of Jesus is not an invitation to consume. The invitation of Jesus is an invitation to serve. It's an invitation to serve. Because ultimately, God believes the greatest joy is not from intake, but from, from output. And even when, you, even when you look at the invitation of Jesus to his disciples, what was his first invitation to them? What was the first thing that he said to them when he called them? Did he come to them and say, listen, come with me and I'll pour into you. Come with me and look at all that I'm going to teach you. Come with me. No, no, no. Listen, listen to his invitation to them. Matthew chapter 4. Several of his disciples highlight this. They highlight this. Matthew chapter 4, 19. Jesus called out to them. And what does he say? Come follow me and I will what? And I will invest in you and I will develop you and I will... No, no, no. He says, and I'll show you how to impact them. The entire invitation is external. The entire invitation is, come here, come here, and I'll show you. I'll show you how to do what matters most. I'll show you how to impact them. Come here, come here. I'll, t- I'll teach you how to serve. How to be a servant like me. From the first invitation. From the first invitation, it was an invitation to impact them. I'm going to say something here that's very difficult for some of you to hear. But one of the most baseline, fundamental truths of who God is, is this. God gives to those who give. And God invests in those who will invest in others. And for some of you, the reason that you're not experiencing God more is because it's all about you. And the reality is, if it continues to be about you, do not expect him to pour mightily into your life. Because God doesn't work that way. And from the beginning of the narrative, he's made it very clear. I give to those who give. In countless of the parables that Jesus tells, he's teaching this truth. He said, no, 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 I give to those. I, he even says it with forgiveness. I forgive those who forgive. I, I give to those who give. Sometimes we talk about this financially, but it's, it's in every area of life. And God steps into our lives and says, no, no, you, you need to pour into them. And it's not something that we wait to do. No, no, you start to do it right now. With whatever you receive from God, you hand that off to someone else. You love them. You invest in them. You don't have to know all the answers to do that. You decide to serve them. You need a Timothy. There are certain things in your life, there are many things in your life that you can't learn until you teach someone else. You can't learn until you hand it off to someone else. It's not something that we develop later. 
as something that needs to be a part of our journey from the beginning. Build that circle. Who are you investing in? And then as we come to this conversation today, if you've walked through circles with us before, we've never talked about this fourth circle. As a matter of fact, we usually talked about it in separate conversations. But we decided this year as we walked through it to bring all of it together because I do believe that God calls us to a fourth circle, to develop a fourth circle. One of the, one of the best examples of this in Paul's life is a guy named Felix. I know some of you are like, Felix, there's no way Felix is a name in the Bible. There's, there's no way. It's not just a cat. It's also an individual in the scriptures. It's an individual that Paul is constantly sharing as he's under house arrest. He's constantly sharing the message of Jesus with him. And here's the other, the other circle that you need in your life. You need people who don't know Christ. You need people that you can introduce to him, that you can share his love with, that you can share his story with. And sometimes as we're on this journey, we can lose that circle. But here's the thing. You've been given a mission. When you step into this relationship with Jesus, you are given a mission. It's not negotiable. Jesus doesn't come to us and say, hey, listen, you know, I've bought you. I've made you new. I've saved you. Could you help me out and tell other people about me? That's not what he says. He says, all right, I've bought you. I've made you new. I've given you my spirit. Now go tell the world. We've been given a mission. It's not negotiable. You need to develop that circle of people who don't know who he is so you can share your story with them, so that you can share the truth of who he is with them and what he's done in your life so that you can invite them to see the body of Christ at work and hear his message. You need to develop that fourth circle. As you look at, as you look at God's word and you look at what he teaches us about community, he's not just saying, listen, community is crucial. He's not just saying pay attention to community, but he's calling us to develop these different relationships, these different circles of relationships in our lives. And if we're going to walk through the next couple of months and look back at something that we can celebrate, look at, look back on something that, that has drawn us closer to him instead of pushing us away from him, it will be because we take community very, very seriously because we're intentional about it. And as we come to this final conversation, I want to bring this to you because I want for you to, to think about, okay, what's my plan in terms of community for the next couple of months? As you walked in today on your seat, you found a sheet. Guys, if you could just bring up the house lights. On that sheet, one side of it is a circles worksheet. And it just lists out these four different types of relationships. You can't see the names for some reason. It printed really light. But you see Paul's and Barnabas's mentors companions, the people we're investing in, the people that we're sharing with. And it just gives you an opportunity to map that out. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. No one's going to create this for you. And here at Hoboken Grace, we can't create this for you. One of the things that we do is we work to facilitate environments where you can create it and where you can build it. And so when we talk about dinner groups, we don't talk about dinner groups because you're going to join a dinner group and you're going to find all these people. You're not going to walk into a dinner group and find all these mentors. As a matter of fact, you may walk into a dinner group and be like, man, these people don't have any discernment. But because you're supposed to be the mentor in that group. But usually when you walk into a dinner group, you find one or two of these people. And then as you're part of an impact team, you find one or two of these people. And at a connection event, you maybe meet another person and you're developing that community. You're building that community. As a, as a church, we can't build this for you, but we can create environments. And what we encourage you to do is take advantage of those environments. And what I want for you to do and what I invite you to do as we walk out of this and as we walk into this week is for you to just sit down and to map out your circles. Where are you? Now, don't get legalistic about this. Like, oh, I got four companions. I'm going to lose a friend, right? That's not what this is about. It's it's about shifting the way that we think about it. It's about shifting the way that we think about understanding how important it is. On a personal personal basis, listen, listen. On a personal basis, there's nothing that I talk to my staff about more than circles. 
There's nothing that I ask them about more than their circles. Why? Because I know, I know the people in their life are going to shape who it is that they're becoming. And I know, I know if they don't have mentors in their life, they're in trouble. And I know if they don't have companions, they're going to be lonely. I know if they don't have Timothys, that they're not experiencing all that God wants to bring into their life. I know if they don't have Felix's, they don't know the joy of the gospel. I know it. And so I'm constantly asking them, how are your circles? What do your circles look like? And so what I want to invite you to in this week is to be able to sit down and map out your circles. Where are you? Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's summertime. It's summertime. You're not going to make 12 new friends this summer. It's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, some of you are looking at your schedule and you don't know how you're going to breathe by the time you get to the end of the summer. And you're traveling all over the place. So here's what I want. Here's, here's my challenge to you as we walk through this. If you map out your circles and there's a circle that doesn't have anyone in it, my challenge to you is to fill that with one person. If you write it out and you realize I don't have a Timothy or I don't, I don't have that mentor in my life, if you, if, you're miss, if, if you have one of those circles that's completely empty, fill it with one person. If, however, and for many of you, as you fill this out, you're going to have people in each of those circles. If you have people in all those circles, here's my challenge to you. Maintain it. I know that doesn't sound all that exciting, does it? But here's the thing about summer. Summer has a way of separating us from the people that we need to be close to the most. And you're no longer in your dinner group as much as you were before. And all of a sudden you get to the end of the summer and you look back and you haven't spent any time with that friend that you need to spend time with. This happens in my life so easily. It happens in my life so easily when it comes to my mentors. Because you know what's true about my mentors? They don't ask for my time. Everybody else asks for my time. They never ask for my time. I have to ask for theirs. And it's really easy to get to the end of the summer and realize you've never talked to the people that you need to influence your decisions more than anyone else. It's really easy to get to the end of the summer and realize that you haven't checked in on that, Timothy. You don't even know what's happening in their life. And rather than getting closer to your neighbor, you've gotten further from your neighbor. Uh, uh, what I'm saying to you is this. As you go into the summer, be intentional about your relationships. Maintain that. Don't try to build it out further. You're probably not going to be able to do that. Just maintain that. Maintain. Invest in those relationships, which means you're going to have to be intentional about your schedule. But map that out. Do you need to add that one person? Do you need to add that one person? Or do you need to look at, okay, how do I make sure that I don't lose track when it comes to my circles? And the thing about it is this. We live in a place... That's very transient. Another reason why I follow up my staff so consistently is that oftentimes we have friends that are just, aren't, they're not here anymore. And so you have to manage this all the time. Come back to it over and over and over again. Community is crucial. On the other side of that sheet, you're going to see a worksheet that just kind of walks you through some of the things that we've been talking about. So how are you going to experience God's word? How much time are you going to give to that? What's your plan as far as how you're going to listen to it or how you're going to read it or whatever it may be, whatever tool you're using there. Maybe you want to be able to develop a daily rhythm. You're going to be using the meditation passage or the memory verse. It talks about service and honor and connection. It talks about resting like we talked about last week. What's your plan as you go into the summer? For most of us, for most of us, if we were to look back on the past 10 summers, listen, for most of us, if we were to look back on the past 10 summers, seven of them moved us in the wrong direction. In my experience, at least seven of them moved us in the wrong direction. But it doesn't have to be that way. 
It doesn't have to be that way. And you really can live a summer that you can look back on and celebrate. You don't have to get to the end of it and be further from him. You can do it. And here's what I know about you. You want to. You want that. You want to know his love more. You want to know his joy more. You want to know him more. Change your plan. Change your plan. We can live a summer. We can live a summer that we can celebrate. And when we live a summer that allows us to know Him better, we also live a summer that allows the world around us to see Him better. And that's what we've been called to do. You can do it. You can. Adjust the plan. Be intentional about community. We can do it together. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for what you've taught us about community. I thank you for what you've taught us about these different relationships and and how you've spoken into our lives about advisors and how you've spoken into our lives about friends and how you've spoken into our lives about those that we're investing in and those that we're sharing with. Father, I I pray that as we walk into this week that that we would take an honest examination of where we are. I I pray for those who who realize I've got a gap here. I've I've got a circle that needs to be filled. I pray that you would give them that you'd give them wisdom as they're stepping into groups or teams or connection events. Father, I pray that you would allow them to be able to find that person, that friend or that, that person that they need to share with, whoever it may be. Father, I pray that you would lead them to that. Father, I pray for those, those who've been working to develop that community. I pray that this summer would not be a time in which they would lose that, but they'd be able to continue to strengthen it, that they'd be able to maintain that Father, I pray for every single person here, every single person watching. I pray that the next couple months would be a great couple months in their lives because they're moving closer to you, not further from you. Father, I I, I pray with all that I am that they would that they would know more your love your joy your peace your patience your kindness your goodness your gentleness and that as a result those around them would be able to see that and know the truth of who you are in Jesus name